Thank you. So, um, thanks very much uh, for inviting me uh, to speak. I, I'm actually truly honoured to be here because I know a lot of people will have no idea who I am and why I'm here. Um, uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective on my work and the things I'm trying to do uh, for those in Canada. Uh, while I was sitting here with you for the last uh, one and a half hours, I was making a note to myself, and it says, do not agree to speak following uh, my previous head of department, an MP, a truly awesome person with lived experience, and a room that hasn't had a break for one and a half hours. Um, so that was the, the note I made uh, to myself, uh, and so I'm really glad that uh, you've been with me. I've been uh, really like to congratulate the um, organizers because uh, what I seen was here yesterday and the program was really just fabulous. Uh, and I was thinking while well, lots of people were talking about drugs, and I was thinking that some of the speakers like Jim Van Oss and others uh, yesterday uh, managed to expand my mind without the use of drugs. Uh, and then some of the questions were just uh, uh, fabulous. It was really fabulous to be here. Now, I'm going to try to get this going. Let's see if I can do it. There we go. And so, just to tell you who I am, um, so you can locate me and understand what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and I still see clients. Uh, I've been a researcher on the social causes of psychosocial problems uh, for many years, but most of my time has spent, is spent at the moment working for government and working with government. Um, and I'm going to need some help from the AV person because everything seems to have seized here and I can't see my notes. Um, and the reason why I've moved from being a clinician to working with government uh, is because, uh, I can just tell the truth, I got a bit sick of it. What I got sick of was um, the fact that I felt like, yeah, this, how do you get that to go up and down? Oh, right. Um, when I say I got sick of it, I never got sick of my clients. What I got sick of was feeling like um, one of those doctors in the movie MASH. And uh, you know there was a series MASH and there were the doctors in the Vietnam War. And those doctors in the Vietnam War spent their time um, uh, sort of uh, getting peak casualties in, um, uh, sort of with a few Band-Aid solutions, making them better, and then putting them back out into the war. And, and that's what they spent their time doing. And uh, I, I felt like people were coming in, people with psychosis were coming in to see, to see me, and I was doing whatever I could, and then I was putting them back into what I thought was a war on them. Uh, for stigma, denial of rights, poorer services, poorer supports, and social marginalization. And I thought, if I could try and do both, a bit of clinical work, but also a bit of policy work uh, to make the world a better place, uh, I might be able to uh, do something about the war, I thought, that was being waged on uh, the people I cared about most. And uh, the, the wonderful thing I think from uh, the time I saw Peter Pan when I was a kid, I always thought I'd love to be Peter Pan. Just never grow up and keep that naivety going. And uh, I've managed to do it to the age of 54, so uh, I think I'm still keeping that naivety going that you can actually uh, make fundamental change and make real change. And uh, that's what I've been trying to do. And so now I work in a policy think tank I still work at university, I still see clients, but I work in a policy think tank and I work with government. And um, I also, and actually when I come to conferences like this, I realize I really miss uh, real people as well. Um, how many of you have been to London? Whoa, everybody's been to London. How many of you have been on the tube? How many of you have heard this strange phrase, mind the gap? <laughs> right, fabulous. Now, uh, do you know why the gap exists? No, any of you? Ah, oh, sorry. 
Now, one of the things you have to know about me is I'm terrible with technology. So I'm actually talking about the next slide, not the current slide. And uh, now it makes sense, eh? Um, so you've all been on the London Underground. You all heard this phrase, mind the gap. Do you know why the gap exists? No? Well, the gap exists because some of the train stations are curved and the trains that come in have carriages that therefore can't fit in the station. And if you, um, if you are in the front of a carriage, you're quite close to the platform. But if you're at the back of the carriage, and at the back you're close to the platform, but if you're in the middle, there's a gap. And that gap is uh, there, and it's been there for ages. And that's why you get this thing, mind the gap. And that's why on this picture, as you can see the curve station, that's why there's a gap. Um, now, the longer the carriage is, the bigger the gap. Uh, quite, quite obviously, because um, it's a bigger curve, yeah? Now, p one of the reasons people get injured on the subway is because of this gap. And they have a simple band-aid solution for the gap, which is to tell everybody to mine the gap. That's what they do, okay? That's the solution. The problem is, and one of the problems with that, is people are told it while they're on the platform. Okay, so while you're on the platform, they say, mind the gap, uh, but they don't really announce it in the train. Uh, but you're actually more likely to fall down the gap when you're getting off the train than when you're getting on the train. And so that's a problem, but they've got a Band-Aid solution. Doesn't work so well because 4,000 people get injured each year. Um, and um, they get injured and actually, you'd have thought, I mean, I don't know whether you thought of it, I've, I was born and brought up in London, and by the age of 20, every time they said, mind the gap, I was saying, fill in the gap. Um, uh, and you just add whatever Anglo-Saxon expletive you want uh, in, in that sentence. Uh, and there are lots of solutions. There are loads of ways of sorting out the gap. Uh, you can produce platforms that come down, uh, off, the, um, off the trains onto the platform to put through the gap. There are buffers that you can put in the gap. They could actually just straighten the, uh, all of the um, uh, uh, stations to make sure that they, everything fits properly. They could produce trains that have an overhang so that they always, so there's always no gap. All of those things could be done. The gap doesn't need to be there, but none of them happen. And the reason none of them happen is because uh, the tube says they're too expensive. Okay, so they use a cost effectiveness a strategy to look at it, and they say, this is too expensive, we're not going to do it any, we're not going to do it. Uh, and things are getting worse. What you probably, uh, I, I'd managed to miss it, but uh, I just uh, came across it uh, recently. Um, the tube, uh, the London Underground, uh, its subsidy has been removed. From next year, there is no subsidy. There is no public subsidy of the, re of, of the tube. And so uh, they're getting into, they're starting to worry. And they're trying to look at everything they can do to save money. And one of the things they're doing to save money is they're buying longer carriages. And they're buying longer carriages because longer carriages are cheaper than shorter carriages. Um, one of the people I was speaking to recently works at Baker Street, and he said that they've introduced longer carriages at Baker Street, and over that time, over the last year, they've had 40 more people falling through the gap, because the gap is bigger when there's uh, longer carriages than shorter carriages. Uh, so, uh, this is, you're going to ask, why is this guy coming up and talking about tube trains and, and what has that got to do with anything? Well, I just wanted to talk about that because um, it's a simple device to talk about uh, gaps and gaps in service, but using the tube gives you an idea of how you analyze a gap. Uh, the gap is clear. There are really obvious, straightforward solutions. People don't need to be injured because all of this can be done. But the actual problem is not the gap. The problem is how 
the tube service and how the London Underground think about the gap what they're willing to do and what they're not willing to do. So when you're trying to make change, you know that if it's going to be a technical solution, it's got to be really cheap, otherwise they're not going to do it. If you're going to start suing people, you're going to hope, hope those people get a huge amount of money, otherwise it won't make a difference. Uh, and what you actually need is a change in values, because as long as they think cost-effectiveness, there is going to be a gap and people are going to fall through the gap, and they're going to keep falling through the gap. I asked my family, my clients, uh, my friends, people with lived experience, what the gaps are for people with psychosocial problems. And yet, the idea of uh, better services that we were talking about before, really important. Uh, the idea of more money is really important. But people have said over and over to me that the real gap is the ability for people with psychosocial dif difficulties to actually thrive and to realize recovery. Not just symptoms, not getting better from symptoms, not symptom control, but actually to thrive. Uh, and they say that the big gap is a life expectancy, the lower life expectancy, the, uh, which is significant. These are the big gaps. These are the big problems. The other things are important, but these are the big met problems that we have to deal with. Hmm. So uh, just talk amongst yourselves for a while while I try and... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I actually think there needs to be fundamental change. And we need to do things very difficultly, I know, differently. I know that some of the Scandinavian countries are ahead of us, but I actually think the real one of the big problems, and this is what I'll say over and over again, is that stigma that people talk about with regards to uh, mental health uh, and mental health services goes right to the heart of government. And government do not think of people uh, with psychosis and people with mental health problems as equal, do not deal with us, as uh, equal in any way, uh, and uh, because of that, uh, everything else in my mind stems from that. And until we get a fundamental shift in the way we actually value people uh, with uh, mental health problems, we're not going anywhere. We need, yeah, uh, you know, you can follow the person who's clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so there needs to be a fundamental change. And people get worried about fundamental change. They say it will never happen. Uh, I say to them that in my uh, 53 years, uh, I've managed to see gay marriage. I've managed to see decreases in racism, though not enough. I've managed to see Thatcherism. Uh, yeah, I've managed to see Reaganism. Uh, and I've managed to see, uh, which I think is the most heinous crime, a huge shift in power from governments to big business. Uh, there has been a revolution. And revolutions can, revolutions can happen, and they do happen. Uh, but the reason why I believe in services, I practice, I love you all for what you do, uh, it was in, it, just heartening to see everybody standing, especially the ones who cry with and for their patients, and I didn't know that my uh, mentor, Robin Murray, had... Uh, actually lost sleepless nights uh, for, for his patients. Uh, but I've, I've worked with him, so I know he's a softy, really. Um, uh, you know, um, the, uh, you know I, I love services, but I just think even if we have the most perfect services, if you're still sending people out into a world that is so inequitable, that where values, uh, even... Uh, Luciana, who seems like a really nice person, is talking cost-effectiveness rather than what really matters and what the values are that we want in society. Uh, if cost-effectiveness is our value, we're lost. Forget it. Yeah. There's more to life than cost-effectiveness. <laughs> if we live in a cost-effectiveness world, the most marginalized and stigmatized, and that's all the people we are and we work with and we work for and we love, we're not going to do as well despite perfect services. Uh, we have to change the dial if we're going to move forward. So I'm going to talk about three gaps and then talk about some things that I think we might be able to do about them. 
Um, just uh, everybody here probably thinks there's a, there's a gap between our rights and realities. Is that a reasonable thing to say? Yeah. There's a difference between rights and our realities. Uh, there's a chap I used to work with uh, who's uh, now a bit of a rock star in uh, India, a psychiatrist called Sumitra Pathari. And he's at the center of mental health law and policy. And his work is just to do one thing. He looks at all of the international agreements that India has signed up to, and then he tries to get domestic policy in line with the international agreements. Because people will go abroad and they make all sorts of pronouncements about how wonderful they say their world, they're, they're going, what the wonderful things they're going to do, and then they get home and don't do it. Yeah? And all he does is try and align that for people with mental health problems so that they get their rights. And one of the things we heard today was the idea that the Labour Party uh, had sort of tried to get uh, this idea that uh, people with mental health uh, problems are equal, uh, that mental health services are equal. And I think that happened in about 2016, uh, which is fabulous. The only problem is the International Convention on Economic and Cultural Light Rights uh, was signed in 1966. So this is 50 years late. And if you don't want to, if you say, well, you know, lots of other countries had problems with that, and then you say, well, there's a Convention for Rights of People with Disabilities, uh, which was there to actually say, okay, people with psychosocial difficulties, people with physical difficulties, people with intellectual difficulties have to have the same rights as everybody else, and you have to ensure them. That's what's got to happen. Uh, that was 2006. So, there's a choice of 50 years or 10 years uh, late, but, you know, uh, it's great that they've done it. But remember, the UK ratified this. Uh, in fact, 162 countries, and most of the 44 countries that are here, have ratified the uh, Convention for Rights in Persons with Disabilities. All of the people from all of the countries here have... Um, you're standing there. Have I done something? See, it reminds me of my kids. My kids, they just sort of hover when I've broken technology one way or the other. I don't know, it, it was it supposed to be the other way around. I'm supposed to be the father. They're supposed to break things. I'm supposed to hover over them. That's what's supposed to happen. It never happens that way around. It's always the other way around. And uh, the, the, the young guy there is uh, trying to keep me on the straight and narrow. So I'm really sorry if people at the back didn't hear my rant because it was, it was meant with uh, incredible passion. Um, but basically, uh, you know, the story thus far, far is we have a whole bunch of rights. And people with psychosocial difficulties have a bunch of rights. And most of the people here in uh, their countries have signed up to these rights, and they don't do them. And that's the situation we have. And we know they don't do them because we know you've got an increased risk of homelessness, increased risk of poverty, increased risk of physical uh, illness, poorer outcomes. Your kids are going to get taken into care. And from John Reed's talk yesterday, you're six times more likely to be burnt, murdered, and 14 times more likely to be victimized uh, if you are a person uh, with a psychosis. And we've seen slides, and um, you know, Robin showed some slides like this earlier. A 10% chance of actual employment if you've got a psychosocial difficulty against 50% chance of uh, being on welfare. Uh, but some people would say the most egregious problem is this. If you smoke, 8 to 10 years on average you, leave a f you lose from your life. If you have depression, 7 to 11 years you lose from your life. But if you have a bipolar, or a diagnosis of schizophrenia, or a diagnosis of alcohol abuse, up to 20 to 24 years you lose from your life. Uh, put it a different way. If you're living in a high-income country and you have a psychosis, you have the life expectancy of a low-income country. You move from the UK, from uh, Denmark, from Sweden, from wherever we're from, to South Sudan as your life expectancy. Uh, there is no way 
that any high-income country can say that it is actually keeping to its uh, international treaties on rights uh, with a 24 to 20 year age gap. Uh, uh, um, that, that, you know, um, that we're just not, uh, I said age gap, I think, instead of uh, um, life expectancy gap. Uh, that is the situation. Uh, we can talk about all sorts of things, but that gap is an egregious uh, stain on our humanity. 20 to 24 years in high-income countries, rich high-income countries. Gap two is between what is needed and what is offered. And this is great. I don't have to talk about this. People talked about this uh, all morning. Uh, you know what's offered. Jim talked about this. This is not the best picture of Jim. He's a very handsome chap. Um, you saw him yesterday in the flesh, and pictures just aren't. This is a picture I could get. Um, Services don't meet people's needs, systems satisfy themselves, and as uh, Deborah was saying earlier, it's worse for marginalized groups. Uh, one of the people from the crowd made a point that I was going to make uh, with regards to we know what's needed, which is this idea of relationships. So the brain is in a relationship with the environment, and mental health problems, you know, you know this, that if when your brain is growing, it seeks out the environment. That's what it needs. It needs the environment to grow. Uh, and it grows your mind. So your mind isn't your brain, it isn't the environment, it's the inter interaction between the two. And that's where mental health problems lie, in the interaction. Partly in how we deal um, with uh, the environment, because our brain is trying to optimize our ability to work in the environment, but also partly in the way that the environment uh, treats us. So the fact that uh, some behaviors are mental health problems is a choice. Because all we're trying to do is optimize, and some people optimize one way, other people optimize another way, some people react to stress one way, other people react to stress in the other way. Deborah was talking about making sense yesterday. Yeah, we're just trying to make sense. But we label some making sense as problematic, and other making sense as not problematic. It depends what you do. They're a sanctioned and non-sanctioned way. So it's a relationship. So all of the work is in that relationship. And if you try and deal with the brain by itself, it's like going to couple therapy and just having one person in the room. And if you try and do the environment by itself, it doesn't work so well either. You've got to have them both together. So we know what's needed. Mental health services, access to physical health services, really, really important. Uh, but protection from risk factors that cause psychological problems that people were talking about before, access to things that actually heal, and uh, you know, dealing with stigma and social standing is really important. Uh, when I talk about healing, I was interested, have you ever heard that there's a quote from um, uh, Malcolm X? Uh, and Malcolm X has this uh, quote around reparations and how you repair things. And he says, if you take a nine inch blade and you put it into my back, uh, and then you take it six inches out, that is not reparations, that doesn't make be things better. If you take it the whole way out, that is not reparations, that doesn't make it better. You have to work out how to heal. What are we doing to heal is really important. One of the reasons I like this slide is because it's from the Canadian Medical Association. And all they've done is they've done the math. And when you do the math, you see that 50% of your risk of any illness and 50% of what leads to, to recovery is your, is, um, your life. 10% is your environment. Uh, and sorry for us, but only 25% is the services. And a small amount is your biology. But this is the Canadian Medical Association, not really a bastion of social, uh, social psychiatry or social factors. It doesn't work that way. They're biologists, but they ran the maths. One of the reasons I like this is just to remind us about what we've been doing. All this is is in, the, is in Canada, and it's taken quintile of income level. So uh, people who, uh, you know, the bottom 20%, the next 20%, the next 20%, and just looking at um, the rates of illness in the different areas. And the reasons I show this is because it helps me later on just to remember 
that one of the things that governments have done, when you really push them on this, they start looking at what they call the truly disadvantaged. They start looking at the bottom 10% or 5% or 20%. And they aim to move the bottom 10 or 20% up to the level of the next 20%. But if they do that, yeah, it makes it better for them, but there's still a huge disparity. The big question is how do you move the 90% to be as well as the 10%? Because that's really what you're supposed to be doing with human rights. And if we need, some people are, um, uh, are graph people, uh, some people are people people, and I think you guys are all people people. I've just been in Scotland. And this is from a BBC documentary, a well-resourced BBC documentary uh, from about 10, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, when you looked at Lynn in Glasgow, a boy who was born in uh, Carlton has a life expectancy of 54. And a boy who was born in Lindsay had a life expectancy of 82. High-income country with 28 years difference. And, you know, these differences are not dissimilar to the differences we see in psychosis. And uh, they're not about the illness. They're about the grinding differences, social differences and inequalities that we see in our societies. And 20 years ago, this was a mystery. Now everybody knows it. This is a classic diagram from Michael Marmot, who, as you know, is really interested in inequalities, and this is from his book. And the reason I put this up is not to show you that it's really complex, it's to show you the opposite. It's to show you that even though he's produced these really important mechanisms, uh, they all stem from the social structure, from the values we have, uh, from how we think about society. And then our material differences, our so uh, social environment, our work, they all come next. And our psychological impacts and our health behaviors are much further down the pathway. It all stems uh, from uh, the social determinants. And it's not difficult to know what we need to do in a complete health response, and luckily, I, I sort of gambled on everybody earlier on uh, saying that we needed um, action on the social determinants of health, so thank you very much, uh, and that we needed flexible, equitable access to recovery-based, diverse, client-driven services. Thanks very much. And we had no conversation about this before. I just gambled that uh, between everybody they might say that. Uh, but I want to go further than that and say that we have to do things uh, and we have to forget about just symptom reduction or how you can perform and consider how individuals and communities actually function. You're not expected to be able to read this. If at the back you can read this, uh, then you don't need to go to an optician anytime soon. Uh, if at the front you can't read this, you really need to go to an optician very soon. Um, the important thing is this is one of these indigenous mental wellness continuums. So this is how indigenous peoples uh, in Canada and various places around the world have been thinking about this forever. And in the middle, they talk about meaning, purpose, uh, and hope, and something I can't read. Because <laughs> I do need to go to an optician very soon. <laughs> Um, but they're really talking about something uh, very different. Then they start talking about communities. Then they start talking about resources. Then they start talking, as you go out, about um, jobs and society and um, housing and education and purpose. Then they start talking about the actors that do it. But it's not anything new. This is the basis of their society. They talk about peace. They talk about balance. They talk about people taking as much as they need and sharing. They talk about societies that are based on, to a certain extent, uh, love and balance uh, with nature. And uh, just remember I started off by saying that I'm naive. I am. I believe this stuff, and I believe this is the way we need to go. We need to be thinking about holistic societies if we really want to sort this out. 
uh, and we need to be able to dream. We need to not be cynical. We need to actually say that uh, you know things can be different. I wanted to quickly show how this links to something that Jim Van Os was talking about yesterday. He was talking about new definitions of health, and his definition of health was really health equals resiliency. So health is being able to uh, deal with what life uh, throws in front of you and uh, then to, to grow. And the Mental Health Foundation and MIND were thinking about resiliency. They were talking about resiliency being the capacity to cope with life's challenges to main and maintain your well-being. But when they were talking about it, they were talking about uh, coping structures, well-being, but they were also talking about social capital. And this is partly because they were saying that resiliency is not just about the individual. It is wrong to think that the individual needs to be made resilient. They think that government should not be let off the hook and they have to think about their social responsibility. Uh, and that services also need to be able to develop community and as well as develop uh, individuals uh, and that public health need to be involved. Uh, there was an interesting moment yesterday in one of the talks um, where um, there was a question. Uh, uh, one of the psychiatrists who's in the talk talked about the fact uh, that he sat for uh, eight to ten hours a day seeing patients. And um, one of our, the people who was presenting, who's a person with lived experience, said, that's really unhealthy. Yeah, that's really unhealthy. Sitting for 10 hours, that's a terrible thing. Uh, and it is. It's a terrible thing. Uh, because has everybody seen this? Does anybody talk? All oh, right, no one talks here. Good. Does everybody seen this? Yes, great. So you know, connecting, keep you learning, take notice, which is your mindfulness. Um, be active, uh, but the thing that people always forget about the keys to resilience is this idea of giving back. That giving back is really important for people's resilience. And uh, giving, as well as receive, receiving, is really important for community resilience as well. What I'm really talking about is getting past this idea of services. Uh, getting past this idea just of the social determinants of health and starting to think of what types of society we want to live in. And I really like this, the idea, and the psychologists here will have seen this over and over again, this idea of coherence, that societies have to make sense. And it sets, and given the idea that we're not going to get rid of all stress, the question is how do we produce societies that allow us to cope with stress and grow both individually and as communities? And I quite like Atonovsky's idea of coherence, this idea that if you're going to um, live in a society and not be stressed by the difficulties that we uh, cause, uh, that you uh, have to understand it, has to make sense. Uh, you have to agree what you're trying to do. It has to be comprehensible and predictable. There needs to be rules and laws, and they have to be fair, and they have to be enforced. Uh, you have to be given the right tools to start making progress towards those aims. Uh, and uh, you have to think it's worth it. Yeah, you've all probably been in areas where people have decided to change things. Um, and um, um, change is always a problem. I think Jim yesterday said, everybody wants to innovate, nobody wants to change. And I thought that was a great one-liner. I'm going to steal it and use it forever. Um, uh, and it's, it's a great one-liner, but it's true. People don't want to change if they don't think it's worth it. And we've all had the situation where people have come up and they've said, we really need to do this. And everybody goes, yeah, 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 yeah. And they say, we're going we're gonna to do this, we're going to do that. We're going to give you all the tools that you need to do this. We're not going to give you any more money and we're not going to give you any more time. Um, so all of this innovation, you're going to have to do on your own back. And at which time you say, that's just not worth it. Yeah. And so... You know, people will change, people will do, but it has to be worth it. And coherent societies have to make sense to people, and people have to buy into them. 
And I'll tell you what I think our aims are and what the aims are that we've, uh, gone to, uh, we've come through. And I think uh, our aims are part of this journey that we've all been on and we've been on uh, since we tried to come out of the caves and we uh, produced societies. And um, these are our agreed aims. And we never even talk about them anymore because we just agree them. Uh, we are actually trying to develop societies in which we can thrive and live in peace. That's the bottom line. That's what we're trying to do. That's what progress is really about. Uh, and those positive rights were agreed. That's how we get UN declarations on human rights. And then we set up a contract with our government and we say, um, we're going to give up a few of those rights for the collective as uh, long as you protect us and make sure uh, that the human project continues in the right direction. And so there's this sort of social contract uh, that we make. Um, how many of you think the social contract is going in the right direction? No. You do. Why not? Uh, not enough time. <laughs> no. The truth is the social contract is, has been, a, for, if you look at over many, many years, uh, the social contract uh, has made uh, incredible uh, strides forward. Um, you know, things are better in many ways than they were before, depending on who you are. Um, but, I mean, the democratic government's part of the contract is to produce better societies in the markets. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, everybody's probably heard this idea that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah? Yes? There's no such thing as a free market. Everything comes at a cost. And the cost is always borne by the most marginalized. That's what the free market does. There is no such thing as a free market. We created governments to work as a collective force to increase equity and to stop greedy, powerful bullies running our societies. That's what the aim is of government. That's what they're there for. And uh, I think it's important to say it. Because this is a, a plot I did. I took some UN data, World Bank data, and I plotted the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is, um, the, uh, is the amount, is how equal uh, country, uh, uh, how equal things are. And I looked at the world Gini coefficient between 1800 and uh, uh, 20, uh, and uh, the year 2002, 2003. And we are less equal as a world now than we were in 1810. Yeah. We've had significant material progress, but we are less equal now than we were 200 years ago. And you know the rich are getting richer. You know the poor aren't doing as well. You probably, most people forget that the UK, and this is for many countries as well, is as prosperous as it's ever been. Uh, what you probably don't know is the percentage of tax coming from the poor has increased, while the percentage of tax has, from the rich has decreased. Uh, and what you've all felt uh, in your countries is decreased spending, especially in the UK, uh, on health. Uh, this is the GDP per capita in the UK, uh, running from the year 2000 through to 2400, uh, 2014. And in about 2008, 2009, uh, we had the crash. Um, I was saying to people, the, the funny thing I had is I, I, went to, uh, I went to Canada in 2007, and that's where I live at the moment. Uh, I'm not responsible for the crash. Um, but I, I went to Canada, and for the first two years I was there, people said, why did you move from London to Toronto? And by 2009, people were saying, how did you know to move from... London to Toronto. Uh, so that's what you've been going through. And if we just carry on the graph, actually we're back at 2008, uh, 2008, 2009 levels. That is the highest GDP per capita. So money per person. The UK is at the highest it has ever been at the moment. It will destroy that with Brexit, but hey. Um, you know, it, it, but that's the highest it's ever been. That's your health spending in real terms decreased by about 10% from 2000 to 
from 2008-2009. Uh, Just to show I'm not party political, uh, the 2008, 2009 to 2010 was Gordon Brown's government. They decreased in real terms health spending. What hasn't happened is as the GDP has gone up, uh, the conservative governments have just carried on decreasing spending. Uh, and that's really what's happening and that's what you're feeling. What you're feeling is a real decrease in spending in real terms while the country is getting richer and richer and richer. And that dissonance and that lack of coherence is one of the things that makes it so difficult uh, to really, um, uh, to, to really uh, keep on working in the system. Uh, and that is why um, our patients aren't doing so well. So what's been happening is governments have been, have been decreasing their responsibility. They've been blaming other people. They've been talking about cost effectiveness. They're not talking about thriving. They're not talking about people living in peace. In fact, they're producing more divisive societies where only some people thrive. I was speaking to the cab driver last night, <coughs> who's a Liverpool uh, football fan and therefore a reasonable person. Um, and uh, I, I've been a Liverpool football fan for, for 45 years and I know my clan. Um, so he's a reasonable person. And uh, so as you can see, some Evertonians sort of cross-armed, <laughs> upset. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what happens. I've got the microphone. Um, so uh, he was saying that he was traveling down to London uh, during 2008-2009 uh, to watch the games. And he could see people literally starving. Uh, uh, some people literally starving and people finding it impossible to make ends meet in, uh, in Liverpool. And when he went down to the games, it was like nothing was happening in London. Yeah. You know, nothing had really changed. Uh, it looked like nothing had happened. Obviously, things happened in the service sector because there had been huge cuts. But when he goes to the games, he said, it looks it's like nothing has happened. Um, so we've, had, we've got problems um, with government. And just to show you how narrow things have got, even today, and I actually think Luciana is one of the, uh, one of the um, sort of good people, well-meaning people, she's still talking cost effectiveness. And when people are talking about poverty, they're talking about money. They're always talking about money. Uh, the UN definition of uh, poverty is not about money. It's about the inability of having choices and opportunities. A violation of human dignity. It means a lack of basic capacity to participate. Money is just one way you get those things, but poverty is not about money. Poverty is about social inclusion. Uh, if you're going to deal with poverty, you have to go further than the money, and you have to think about how you set up scientists, uh, societies where there's proper social inclusion, otherwise you don't have a proper society. This is the only thing that it may sound, uh, say, sound like I've been quite political throughout, but I just want to say a couple of things that are clearly political. Um, there'll be elections, and when you go to elections, there'll be people who will ask you to vote for smaller government. Um, just remember when they ask you that the world is more complex than it's ever been. Large corporations are bigger and stronger than they were. And if you vote for smaller government, you disempower yourselves and you disempower uh, the chance of doing the right thing for our clients. Some people ask you for tax decreases when the gaps between rich and poor are greater than they've ever been. And when you cut it, when we're cutting vital services and when uh, uh, taxes for the rich will really not hurt them, they won't even notice because they're getting so much money. And it will make no impact to their health, but it will make a big impact to other people's health if they're taxed properly. Some people are going to ask you to vote selfishly. And for me, I think that's the most pernicious, uh, uh, pernicious thing, because this human project and this human journey that we're on is, is about how we pr pr improve society collectively. It is not about selfishness. Uh, the social contract is specifically not about selfishness. It's about voting for what's best for everybody and doing what's best for everybody, not 
uh, blinkered self-interest. Uh, you know, for me, at times, it feels like uh, governments have really lost the plot in what they're actually there for. They're there to make a better world and protect us. They're there to have leadership. They're there to do the how. They're there to have the ideas that really transform us. And they're abdicating responsibility for that. And, my, and in my mind, they're, they're breaking their part of the social contract. And that's why I think uh, a bunch of young people I'm speaking, I, I speak to, cause that's why they don't vote. They're put off by it because they really understand in one ways, but implicitly the social contract, and they really see government not wanting to deliver their side. So the next time you're on the tube and someone says, mind the gap, swear at them and say, fill in the gap. Okay? You know, we've got the big problems. Those big problems, we say that our ability to thrive and realize recovery over life expectancy. I talked about um, thinking about rights. Why haven't we got a rights-based strategy on mental health? I, I hear what everybody's saying about doing the right thing, trying to get small wins, trying to get small amounts of money. But really, um, I think we need to go bigger. We have rights enshrined in UN conventions and in law that are being violated at a level that's unprecedented. Uh, I think we need a rights-based uh, mental health um, uh, strategy. And we, want, we need the right to health delivered. Remember, the right to health is about having equity in the highest possible level of mental and physical health. Yeah. The highest possible. That is our right. That's a right that we have. Uh, there should be action plans for this. Having um, a law passed here and there is great as long as it comes with an action plan. Um, I was speaking to others yesterday saying one of the problems that we all have is IDD, which didn't make it into DSM-5, but it stands for Implementation Deficit Disorder. And we really need to do something about that. If there's medication for Implementation Deficit Disorder, I'll do that. Uh, and if you can come up with a psychological treatment, I'll do that first. Okay. But we need proper protections for our clients. We always talk about services, but I actually want much more action on the social determinants of health. Uh, but I want to swap it round. We're always looking at uh, protections uh, we want to, uh, for the social determinants of health, but I actually want them to be positive br blueprints for the society we want. Why should there be homelessness? Why should there be big differences in school performance? Why should there be differences and huge differences in the amount people earn and their life expectancy? Why should there be differences in, where you, in whether you can get access to psychological services? Why, why should there be any of these differences? Uh, those differences, where you see the difference, it's possible to flip it and say that's a target. The target is equity. And the last is a very straightforward thing. Our governments need to protect us. They need to do tax, is a three-letter word, not a four-letter word. Uh, should be allowed to be said uh, in polite circles. Um, we need to think about how all voices can be heard. But we really need to think about that social contract. Uh, I am really interested in how the 90% can have the same health status and longevity and enjoy the same quality of life as the 10% of high earners. That's what I want, that's what I want to see. I, I don't want, to, because that's what, uh, in theory, our rights are. So, I'm Pollyanna, it can't be done. Um, I live in Ontario where our services are underfunded significantly, so uh, we need another billion a year. But we're making some progress. Uh, we have a basic income pilot. We're giving 4,000 people uh, $20,000 a year uh, to see whether it changes their health and their mental health. And that's a government project. We're increasing access to psychotherapy, but we haven't managed to increase access to uh, psychotherapy for psychosis. Uh, the government say it's gonna end homelessness by 2025, specifically focusing on chronic homelessness uh, and we've managed to get that through. 
we're going to have 30,000 new supported housing units uh, for people with mental health problems. Uh, and we have a new cabinet committee, uh, cross-cabinet in the Ontario government, uh, that is uh, looking specifically at mental health and how every government department can uh, make mental health uh, important to them. And then we've increased the minimum wage and job protections, and we've tried to do some work on making society better. We're, we're nowhere near there, uh, but we're moving forward uh, because we're pushing on the social determinants rather than anything else. Filling the gap is possible on the tube, but it would really need a culture change. Um, it needs a re-evaluation of, value, of uh, values and the relationship between the tube, us, and the state. I actually think filling the gap for people with um, uh, psychosis is, is also possible, um, but it won't happen through tinkering with services. Uh, and will take a reorganization of what we actually expect and demand from the state. Um, the question for all of us is, uh, do we continue to work just in our jobs as service providers, which I think is a noble, important thing to do? Uh, or do we add advocacy, rights and legal challenges, and political action uh, to our, uh, to our um, armamentum, um, armamentarium to improve the lives of the people we work for? Um, I, you sort of know where I stand on that, uh, but I leave it as a rhetorical uh, question for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kwame. Uh, there is time for uh, a couple of comments or, or questions. We have five minutes before the break. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, but um, I, I uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, I, um, I, I noticed that you were saying, yeah, we should ask ourselves if, if we should, you know, vote for ourselves, selfish voting, or for the community. And, um, you know, my, the, the movie Beautiful Mind came to my mind because, you know, we're still practicing Adam Smith as our economic theory. And we have a, a fellow uh, experience expert who died a few years ago. His name was... Uh, um, um, but, uh, he, he was a mathematician in, in, in Princeton and, and he suffered from schizophrenia and he got the Nobel Prize for economics. Because John Nash, because he, he improved on, on, uh, on Adam Smith and, and economic professors still push Adam Smith. How, how come that? You know, why, why is the university not in, in this, in the front of it, you know, to change the world. Yeah, I think uh, I completely understand. I mean, you know, uh, the truth is that if you happen to be a hammer, everything looks like a nail, really. And economic theorists in general uh, keep, uh, keep with monetary theory. Um, but there is a, a book that you might want to read. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. I think his name's Sandler, and he's a professor at Harvard. And he, uh, I think it's called What the Markets uh, Can't Do. And it really talks about the fact that economic theory started as uh, essentially an amoral theory that now is moving into the moral realm. And economists don't know how to do that. And so they stick to what they know, though, um, you know, what they're actually doing now is, is philosophy. And it's a difficult thing for them to do, so they retreat back to market theory. But market theory will never deliver for the disenfranchised. It never has, it never will, that's not what it does. Uh, what it does is, is it makes some people rich, uh, but it does it at the expense of other people. That's what it does. Uh, it doesn't produce societies that are equitable, and the marginalized are going to do worse. 
that's what it does. Uh, and they know that. Hi, um, thank you for... Claudia Bartocci from Italy. Thank oh. you very much for yeah. your presentation and for your English. I agree, the problem is not the gap, but, come dice Anna Freud, il problema non è quello che è successo a Leo, ma quello che Leo fa di quello che gli succede. E in questa associazione internazionale noi ci proponiamo di risolvere grandi problemi, ma non siamo in grado di risolvere un piccolo problema, cioè il fatto che noi, non prima lingua inglese, non possiamo capire la maggior parte delle interessantissime cose che voi dite. Thank you for the effort. No, I, I, I think I understood and she was saying that some people only understand a little bit rather than the whole thing because of, the, because of that. I tried to make it less idiomatic. I hope that worked for you. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for... So, hi, I'm... Jeez, I'm here. finally hearing voices. Uh, uh, where are you? I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm just a bit shy, so I'm not oh, going to stand up. That's um, right. <laughs> thank you for a very inspiring talk. Um, the inequalities and um, social determinants are an area that is just so vague sometimes, and you've put it very eloquently. Um, on the social contract, I think that it's very important for each person to live the society that they want. And um, on coherence, on working with people each day that may come from um, a socially determined background that don't have the same uh, opportunities and abilities that we do, I think it's so important to enable people to access the society we're creating. When, uh, when working on the wards, educating people about what their rights are, how to work the system, and who to speak to about what, how to have their voice heard, then we, we may not necessarily, myself at the moment, be able to change the wider social determinants, but I know that I can support each individual I come to up to the level that they need to be to do it for themselves. I think that's so, so important as practitioners. So. No, I, I, I agree, and uh, one of the things that had been said earlier is uh, the work that uh, has been done at St Michael's Hospital in Toronto, uh, where they have a, um, an assessment that is done, a poverty assessment, uh, and uh, so the clinicians then uh, sit and say, OK, you know, what do you... You know, have you got everything that you need? Have you got everything that state will give you? And then they try and help people get that, and, and that works. But I just want the pie to be bigger, okay? So I want the social housing to be proper housing, uh, and the, uh, you know, the work to be proper work, and the benefits. Uh, at the moment, if you're in Ontario and you get all of your benefits, you live in poverty, yeah? And that, I find, egregious, that the government, it's state-sponsored poverty. What's that all about in 2017? So that's the sort of, I totally agree, get exactly what you can as much as you can, but I want that to be bigger, what you, what you can get. And, and it's possible, because we're rich, and don't believe the lie that we're not rich. We are rich in the 44 countries that are represented here in general. We are rich, and we can do this. Okay, thank you for okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.